Chapter 57, Past vs. Future Stark Industries, Malibu, Los Angeles May 28, 2009, 1320H Local Mr. Stain Jarvis announced This statement caused quite a stir from everyone inside the house. In the three months between Tony's announcement and now, Pepper was able to stall Obadiah from visiting the mansion by flooding him with work. This ensured that Obadiah wouldn't be able to hinder Tony's investigation and to distance Morgan to the possible danger. Obadiah visiting now meant something different happened. Naruto rushed towards the kitchen with Tony behind him, while still carrying Morgan. He was internally scolding himself for forgetting to be ever vigilant, even if he was in a relatively secure area. Jess, Peps, can you take Morgan upstairs? I'll stay here with Tony to meet Stain. Naruto said while handing Morgan over to Pepper before turning back to Tony. I know you're already suspecting Stain, so for the love of God, don't talk too much. Pepper and Jessica had already left the kitchen and walked towards Morgan's room. They would hide with Morgan there until they were called back. I know, I know. Tony replied with faux confidence. Being one of the smartest people alive, he could see that the pieces of evidence were pointing to the board members. Add the fact that only Obadiah is in a position to take over Stark Industries if he was gone, and he immediately becomes the primary suspect. Still, his relationship with Obadiah prevents him from fully accepting the theory. What are you going to do? Nar Naruto started walking towards the front door, but not before rapidly changing to a black suit right before Tony's eyes. Black shades and an earpiece also appeared on his head, making him look like a secret service agent. Tony understood Naruto's intention to act as his bodyguard, but it was just too much. There was nothing that could be done about it, though since Obadiah has already been waiting too long outside. Naruto walked towards the door and opened it, revealing an imposing Obadiah stain, but he just brushed it off. Mr. Stain I'm Nathan Umber. Mr. Stark's head of independent security under Mr. Hogan. Naruto lied while extending his hand towards the older man. He made sure to use one of his identities so that in the off chance, Stain looks into his identities. He would not find anything of value. Is Tony inside? I need to talk to him. Stain said with well-acted concern. Only Karama's negative emotion since tipped him off of Stain's real feelings about Tony. Yes, sir. Please follow me. Naruto replied before walking back inside and heading straight towards the kitchen. Naruto made sure he locked the door and used his shinigan to check Stain for weapons. His vigilance immediately paid off since he found half a dozen Stark Industries tech in Stain's pockets. He released a small burst of lightning chakra to disable the devices. Obadiah saw Tony pouring two cups of coffee on top of the kitchen counter. He saw the guard stop just outside the kitchen, giving them privacy while still close enough to respond to any situation. This unforeseeable development prevented him from doing anything drastic. One th thing he noticed, though, was the absence of Pepper and his daughter. Tony, how are you? Obadiah asked, trying to start the conversation. Tony slid one of the coffee cups closer towards Obadiah. Busy. All the wedding prep is severely cutting into my workshop time. Time. Tony said dismissively as he took a swig from his coffee. But you're not here to check in in me. Otherwise, you would have come to visit me earlier. So, what do you need, Obi? Obadiah released a sigh. Tony was never one for small talk, and it was going to work against him. It would make it a lot harder to talk Tony into doing what he wants, but he can still make do. Still can't get anything past you, eh, Tony? Obadiah placated jestingly before turning more serious. I need you to open up the weapons division. Don't start again, Obi. Until I find out who is selling my stuff on the black market, I don't need to do anything. Tony interjected forcefully. 
Besides, our total income has increased by 8% ever since the weapons division closure. If anything, you should be asking me not to open it. He retorted. Obadiah, of course, knew about this small fact, but closing down the weapon division practically halted most of his cash flow. Selling weapons on the black market was the sole reason he was able to build up his war chest to what he had initially thought was enough to take over the company. He just wasn't able to factor in one thing, an invisible stakeholder with at least 10% stocks. Stain was only able to figure it out two weeks back after he helped the accounting department look through the company books. He could see the telltale signs of multiple shell companies owning small shares, all owned by one person. He had no idea who it was, but he was pretty sure that someone high up facilitated it. We are ironmongers, Tony. Obadiah shouted, frustrated about how stubborn Tony was being. Your father built this company to help people by making sure the government could protect them. I will not have you dishonor his legacy by bringing the company down. He added, trying to use Tony's daddy issues against him. Tony immediately paused mid-sip when he heard Obadiah's statement. Even though he believed that he had already moved on from his trauma, he still freezes up every time that he hears about his parents. Breaking out of his trance isn't much better, since a mix of overwhelming emotions started to fill him. Obadiah was smirking internally. Knowing Tony for as long as he did, he had picked up some things from his personality. He was just waiting for the inevitable blow-up that would allow him to manipulate Tony, but it looked like fate had other plans in mind. Mr. Stark Ms. Potts is calling. Would you like to answer? Naruto interjected, causing Tony to snap out of his stupor. Naruto had been observing the conversation, making sure that Obadiah was not going to do anything. That was why he was able to text Pepper to cover for him if he called. Just in time, too, since Tony's negative emotions suddenly skyrocketed, giving him a reason to call Pepper. Sure. Let me talk to her now. Tony replied. Naruto then walked towards the counter island and placed his phone on it before sliding it over towards Tony since he still doesn't want to be handled stuff. Tony recognized Naruto's tactic to break him out of his emotional spiral. Although, he's not answering for the sake of it. He really needed to talk to Pepper after the blatant manipulation from Obadiah. Obadiah, on the other hand, was internally cursing the guard. He wasn't sure if that umber did it purposefully, but the guard was still a thorn on his side. Tony picked up the phone and placed it up to his ear, making sure it wasn't on speakers. Hey, Peps. Heard you were looking for me? Miss me already? Tony asked jokingly, trying to lift his spirits. Keep dreaming, Tony. We're having some girl time. Pepper replied with a, with a chuckle. All right. I'll pick you up later. Tony said before closing the phone and leaving him a lot more calm. He turned his attention toward Obadiah. My father might have built the company but I made it into what it is today. There's nothing you can tell me that will change my mind. He said with finality. Obadiah couldn't believe that his plan didn't work and all because of a simple phone call. He knew that there was nothing else he could do to convince Tony otherwise. He released a sigh before drinking all of the coffee and turning towards Stark. Okay. Just don't tell me that I didn't warn you. Obadiah replied. I should go. The audit is still ongoing, and there's a lot more to do. He added before quickly walking out without even giving Tony a chance to reply. Naruto followed Stain out of the door, acting as the perfect bodyguard. He walked ahead of Stain and opened the door. Have a safe trip, Mr. Stain. Naruto said. Obadiah stared at the guard for a good while trying to get a read on the guy that fucked the meeting up. Before I go, what's your name again? Obadiah asked, making sure that he gets the right name for his guys to look into. Nathan Umber, Sir Naruto answered without hesitation. 
Good man. Stain replied while removing the imaginary dust on Naruto's shoulder. Make sure to look after Tony. He'll need it. He continued ominously before getting on the waiting SUV. As the car was driving away, Tony approached Naruto from behind. So he's the guy, huh? Tony let out, referring to the leech inside his company. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. What are you going to do about it? Naruto replied while simultaneously changing his suit. I'll have Jarvis track everything he does. I need something that will link everything I have to him. Just make sure you don't do anything stupid. You still have a wedding to get to. Naruto's statement caused both men to laugh before heading back inside the mansion. Pushing aside thoughts about Stain and just looking forward to Rodi's interview. Obadiah, on the other hand, was still seething with how the meeting concluded when he received a call. He retrieved his phone and immediately saw that it was encrypted. Stain. Obadiah greeted as soon as he answered. It's Raza. I have something you might want to see. Triskelion, Washington, D.C. June 3, 2009, 0900 H. Local. Fury was currently standing inside his office, in front of the large window overlooking the Washington skyline. Hill was just behind him, reading out reports from multiple high-level missions. On the other hand, the missions in Taiwan failed though a second team has already been sent. Hill ended. Good. At least they aren't that incompetent. Fury commented. What's the progress report for Project Olympus? He asked. Project Olympus was one of Fury's pet project alongside the Avengers Initiative. Olympus was the codename given for the helicarrier's design and construction. It was originally a Navy project with the goal of creating bases with more stealth and maneuverability compared to regular aircraft carriers. The whole thing was already a decade in the making. When Fury saw the scrap designs, he immediately took it and placed the best minds S.H.I.E.L.D. had to offer in order to make it their own. He was able to put everything he wanted in there. They were going to hide it by using radar-absorbing coats to make it their own. He was able to put everything he wanted in there. They were going to hide it by using radar-absorbing coats and retroactive panels, making them practically invisible from the sides and below. The only downside was that they would have to stay far away from regular air traffic lanes, since the maximum operating height is only around 25,000 feet, making the helicarrier well below commercial, commercial airplane cruising altitude. Everything had a price, though, and his dream base certainly didn't come cheap since it had already cost him $30 billion with another estimated $15 billion more needed to make it operational. The helicarrier was five times pricier than a Nimitz-class carrier and three times the Ford-class carrier, which is still in development. Hill did a few swipes on her tablet before finding what she was looking for. The main vessel itself is already at 70%, but there's a problem with turbines. Hill answered. Since the turbine engine power was increased by 25% to accommodate for potential engine lost, production has slowed down by 10%. She explained. The estimated completion time is around November 2011, sir. Fury released a grunt that could mean anything, at least for Hill. In reality, Fury was ecstatic about how soon he would get the carrier. How about the initiative? What's the latest report on the potential members? Fury asked, referring to his other pet project. Hill quickly adopted a displeased look. She had already voiced her displeasure about the whole Avengers initiative. She just couldn't see the use of loose cannons in trying to protect the world. Dr. Hyde is still in Brazil, working at a bottling plant. Ross is trying to call a ringer from the UK. We're still looking into who he's trying to call. Hill reported starting with Dr. Banner. Barton and Romanoff are doing their missions. We have no idea where the fox is. She continued. 
We got a whole bunch of potential candidates from the index, but I have no idea why you can't just choose from any of them. Because they're inefficient. Fury replied like it answers everything. Add another one on the list. Who? Tony Stark. I heard he built something new. He answered. Hill was, of course, surprised with Fury's order. Tony Stark was one of the few guys with a standing do not interact order, and Fury wanted to invite him to his Power Rangers. Although she still obeyed Fury's order, Fury would further inquire about the Avengers initiative, but a headache decided to show himself. Hey! Cyclops! What the hell, man? What's taking you so long? Naruto shouted as soon as he appeared right in front of Fury, with his back facing Maria. Fury's eyebrow started to twitch, but he kept his calm. Hill, on the other hand, followed her instincts and quickly drew her gun and pointed it at Naruto. She only holstered gun when Fury's gun remained untouched. You need to give me more than that. Fury responded with false calm. He already connected Naruto as the harbinger of headaches. The bug blew. America's ass. The most patriotic guy in existence. The captain. Why haven't you guys found him yet? Naruto replied. One might question why Naruto was acting like this over the fact that the captain was still in the ice. However, everything could be explained with one word, Peggy. That's right. Peggy had been continuously asking Naruto about S.H.I.E.L.D.'s progress on finding the captain. The last time he was in Switzerland, which was five minutes ago, he had enough with all the asking. Don't get him wrong. He wasn't annoyed with Peggy, but rather with S.H.I.E.L.D. The S.H.I.E.L.D. survey party was like only 10 kilometers away from the captain before moving to another quadrant. It's simple. Coulson just hasn't found him. I can't exactly throw large amounts of resources even if it's to find the captain. Fury retorted. Wait a second. Naruto said before suddenly disappearing. Um. Who was that, sir? Hill asked. She was pretty sure who that wad, but it was better to be sure. Right. You still haven't met the asshole personally. Fury mused. That was the Nine Tails or the Fox. You might know the guy as Romanoff's boyfriend. Ha. Huh. Ha. Huh. He really has quite a personality on him. I thought all of you were just exaggerating. Hill replied before Naruto appeared again. Naruto didn't show up alone this time since a disoriented Coulson was with him. It looked like Naruto had just pulled Coulson out of the bed since his suit is slightly disordered. Wake up, Coulson. You are going to want to be awake for this. Naruto said while patting Coulson on the back. I'm awake. Don't worry. Coulson replied with a little less energy than usual. Now, what's the reason you pulled me out of bed and brought me in front of my boss? Naruto reached behind him and pulled out a map with a lot of writing. Coulson recognized it as his survey map. Hill walked over beside Fury to get a better look at what was happening. Recognize this? Naruto asked. Yeah. That's my copy of the crew's survey map that's looking for the captain. I'm not even going to ask how you found that. Coulson replied, a lot more alert. He was reasonably sure that he was going to learn something new. Preferably the captain's location. Exactly. Naruto commented with a smile before pointing at the shield survey crew's current position. Your guys are currently here. He then moved his finger to another place on the map. They were here before. Do you know what's 10 kilometers north of that position? I'm not going to like the answer, am I? Coulson replied. Depending on how you look at it. Naruto retorted with a grin. You still want to find the captain, right? Northern Afghanistan. 
June 5, 2009, 2200H Local. Mr. Stain. A pleasure to finally meet you in person. Raza greeted Stain while extending his hand. A loyal customer, eh? Stain replied while shaking Raza's hand. Now, what is it you want to show me? He asked, trying to move the conversation forward. He doesn't want to stay in the middle of nowhere. Raza walked towards the huge table inside the room. This was made by Stark during their escape. The thing that will change warfare as we know it. Raza said theatrically before pulling the cover off, revealing a metal suit of armor. The modern reincarnation of the night. He added. The scary thing is, he has already perfected it. Stain was immediately mesmerized by the suit of armor. He already knew that Tony was a genius, but this just brings it to another level. Amazing. Stain mused in awe before noticing the gap in the middle of the chest plate. What's missing here? The doctor placed an electromagnet in his chest to prevent shrapnel from damaging his heart. My men say that something was glowing at the center of his chest. That might be what powers it. Raza answered. Hmm. Stain let out while pulling something out from his pocket and placing it on his ear. What do you want for me to take this? Two more Jericho missiles and one of. Raza tried to answer before he suddenly felt paralyzed. You see this? Stain asked while showing a small device. This is one of SI's prototypes. A neural overload device. It releases a series of high-frequency sounds and electromagnetic waves that essentially give you epilepsy. This right here. Pointing to a device behind his ear. Counteracts the EM waves. Raza was glaring hatefully at Stain. Thank you for the gift he added before walking outside and looking towards his guards. Clean everything up and pack up the armor inside. He ordered. Stain's guards acknowledged his order and started to shoot everyone in the camp. Stain just pushed everything out of his mind and got inside the car. Chapter 58, Shad V Melt It Down Shield Safe House, New York June 7, 2009 2300H local. Damn, the captain is hot. Naruto stated a little louder than he would have liked. Everyone else in the room turned their head to towards him and gave him an appraising look. Hey. I'm into chicks but come on. Look at the guy. He defended himself. Everyone in the room was here with one express purpose, watching over Captain America. Naruto, Fury, and Hill were the only people inside the personal observation deck with a one-way mirror overlooking at a surgical suite, where the still partially frozen captain was being checked. Coulson was in the suite overseeing everything. Moving on. Hill stated, ignoring Naruto. We have already performed an MRI, CT, and brain scan. We have 100% confirmation that he's still alive and partially conscious. It's like he just went into hibernation. I don't think any average human would just hibernate in that situation. They would have just immediately died, or just become frostbitten until they died. Naruto weighed in. Erksine's formula must be godly as hell. You guys just fucked up with that banner guy. Project Reborn was not ours, and you know that. Fury defended Shield. Ross got a little too. Enthusiastic with his project. Fury just wouldn't admit that the military just got the jump on him. Whoever thought of hiring Dr. Banner as the lead researcher must be among the few geniuses in the military. However, the way they handled the fallout of the Hulk countered his idea that there were smart guys in the military. Either way, Banner is still in Brazil. I'm not trying to keep as close as an eye on him as possible. Although, I pushed some stuff away. We don't want a tank on steroids in the middle of Rio, right? Naruto replied. But, I think he is planning to return stateside. 
What makes you say that? Hill asked. There was absolutely no intel about that. She should know since she was the one who monitors the intel coming in from all the initiative candidates. He leaves his laptop in his apartment when he goes to work. You should look into that. Naruto answered. Not really providing the reason, the reason while still giving advice. He then turned towards Fury. By the way, I still haven't got paid for Cap's intel. Don't think just because I'm going out with Nat that I work for free. Huh. I thought you did it out of the goodness of your heart. Fury replied sarcastically. Yeah yeah. Joke all you want, Fury. I can just take the captain there and bury him somewhere else. Naruto retorted half seriously. Of course, it's a messed up idea, and he had no intention of doing it. If he ever wants to scare Fury into doing something, like maybe paying his dues, he would just need to take the captain away and bring him to Switzerland. Fury's eyes narrowed and stared down Naruto, trying to assess if Naruto would go through his threat. He was using his training to try and read Naruto's tics, but it looked like it wouldn't work. He released a sigh before giving in. What do you want? Fury asked. Hmm. Can I borrow Cap's shield for a week? Naruto said with a mischievous grin. Why? I just want to play with it for a bit. Naruto replied with a shrug before reaching for something behind him. Come on, Nikki. I already have it with me. Fine. Just give it back within a week. Fury answered resignedly. Yes. Naruto exclaimed with a fist pump before putting the shield away. The trio turned their attention back to the still partially frozen captain. What's your plan for him? Assuming he wakes up. Naruto asked. We're going to make a halfway house somewhere and slowly break the news. Hill answered instead for fury. How are you guys going to do that? We've got an old building we could use. Some agents would become actors. The goal is to just set him up first before slowly reintegrating him. Fury replied, relating the plan that he settled on after Hill consulted with some psychologists. Naruto looked at the two agents incredulously before laughing. Laughing. He was laughing so hard that he was already on the floor, holding his stomach. It continued for at least five minutes. He slowly stood up and wiped the tears at the corner of his eye. Oh wow. Haven't laughed that hard for a long time. Naruto mused. Fury and Hill just stared at the self-proclaimed mercenary. They had no idea what Naruto found so funny about their plan, but he just had to know what it was. Care to share with the class? Fury inquired with a raised eyebrow. You really don't know, do you? Naruto replied to which Fury just gave another stare. Come on. He's the captain. He's got an IQ of like 180, an eye for detail, and an eidetic memory. What do you think would happen? He rhetorically asked. Naruto practically spelled out his reasoning, which boiled down to the captain figuring out the ruse almost immediately. This would make a lousy impression of S.H.I.E.L.D. But even after all that, Fury still couldn't understand his logic. I thought you guys are supposed to be smart. Naruto commented with a shake of his head. I'm not going to tell you anymore. Just work it out. He added. Anyways, I have to go. Just keep me posted on how your plan works out. He states with a small chuckle before suddenly disappearing. Fury started gritting his teeth. Finding Captain America was one of the most monumental parts of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s history, and making sure everything worked out with the cap was paramount. If Naruto found something wrong with how he would do it, then he should be made aware of it to make sure it could be studied. He'll find out what he's talking about. Fury ordered. I, I got an idea, sir. 
Hill hesitantly replied. Fury gave Hill a nod, urging her to continue. It's common knowledge that the captain is as straight of a shooter kind of guy we are going to get. If we ever want him to join S.H.I.E.L.D. in the future, we need to be honest with him from the start, or at least not present him a false front. Fury stood silent for about a minute, thinking about all the possible approaches that he could take about introducing Rogers to the world, and all its potential repercussions. Send me a write-up from the psychologists on retainer. Fury ordered before walking out of the room. Hill followed close behind. John, Switzerland. June 8, 2009, 0530 H Local. Peggy was doing some basic yoga positions, stretching out her body before going for her daily run. She checked the resistance level of the band on her wrist. It was currently set on only four times resistance, and it was already making everything harder than it should be. She was about to walk out of the door when it suddenly opened from the outside, revealing Naruto, who was sporting a wide grin. Oh. Hi. What are you doing here so early? Peggy asked, a little surprised. It wasn't abnormal for Naruto to suddenly appear out of nowhere, that was basically one of his quirks, but it was very rare for him to show up this early or this excited. I've got news and you're going to love it. Naruto replied, walking past Peggy and entering the house. I'm going for a run. Can't you just tell me while we're running? Peggy suggested, her military conditioning practically forcing her to stick to her schedule. Oh, you're not going to say that for long. Naruto retorted before reaching behind him revealing something large, metallic, and circular. Peggy's breath hitched, and tears started forming at the corner of her eyes as she immediately recognized that the object was Steve's shield. They finally found him? Peggy whispered in a shaky voice. She felt her legs slowly turn into jelly. Naruto recognized the signs and pulled Peggy towards the couch. Couch. He then walked towards the kitchen to fetch her some water. Peggy gratefully took the glass and took a tentative sip. You okay? Naruto checked. He could see that Peggy was holding herself back a lot. Yes. I'm fine. More than fine, actually. Peggy answered after clearing her throat. When did they found him? A day or two ago. He just arrived two hours ago at a S.H.I.E.L.D. medical safe house in New York. Naruto replied. I just borrowed the S.H.I.E.L.D. to show you. Like proof of life or something. He added with an awkward chuckle. How is he? They did a whole bunch of tests. MRI, CT, and a brain scan. Everything looks normal, well normal for a super soldier placed on ice. Naruto explained. He's still on ice though. They want to make sure everything's ready before waking him up. Peggy slowly nodded, feeling absolutely relieved that Steve was all right until she realized what Naruto just said. Ready for what? Peggy asked. The welcome party, of course. Naruto answered like it was the most obvious thing. Fury's still debating on how he wants to do it but he's leaning towards one of the options. I called him stupid for it. I'll need to hear it first, but I got a feeling it's ludicrous if you called it stupid, Peggy stated. Fury wanted to wake him up in a 40s-50s hospital room. They're going to say they just found him a few months after the crash and slowly let him adjust. Naruto stated. Bloody wanker. What the hell is wrong with Fury? Peggy exclaimed. Steve would figure it out immediately, even before Project Rebirth. She adopted a faraway look, remembering Steve's time during basic training. He always had an eye for detail, and an unorthodox mind. Add the fact that he absolutely hates liars, just behind bullies and. She left the last part unfinished. Fury's thought process is understandable. He has been a spy for so long.
so long that his option always goes into deception, and other stuff like that. Naruto stated seriously before cheering back up. Anyway. We got three months to whip you back to shape. Are you saying I'm fat? Peggy asked with a dangerously low voice. No. No. Of course not. Naruto replied quickly while cursing himself for not thinking things through. I'm just saying that if you want to keep up with the captain, we should start training your specialized katas up to a certain level. He explained. Bollocks. Peggy cursed under her breath. When are we gonna start? Now. Just right after you do your daily routine and stuff. Naruto said as he walked back towards the door, but he suddenly stopped right before he walked out. Stupid. Stupid. Ugh. He exclaimed while banging his head on the door. Peggy stared at Naruto with both worry and curiosity. She walked up behind Naruto and placed her hand on his shoulder. Naruto turned his head towards her. What's the problem? Peggy asked with a soft voice. Tony and I just overlooked something, and it might just bite us in the ass. Naruto answered. We'll start with the katas tomorrow. I need to handle something. He added before suddenly disappearing leaving Peggy on her own. Ugh. He's just gonna leave me with no other details. Peggy complained. Kids these days. No respect for the elderly. She said before walking out of the door to start her run. She couldn't stop her smile though every time she remembered that Steve is finally out of the ice. Stark Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles. June 7, 2009, 2100 H. Local. Tony, Pepper, and Morgan were enjoying their rare time off. Nothing like family time to recenter oneself even amidst everything that has been happening. The Stark family was just sitting on the couch with Pepper playing with Mor Morgan, when Tony returned back to the living room with a bowl of popcorn. Don't get me wrong, I love the excitement, variety, and all of that, but sometimes it's nice to have some downtime. Tony mused out loud. Yeah, and then Naruto suddenly shows up out of nowhere. Pepper replied. Morgan perked up when she heard Naruto's name. Naruto? Morgan asked while looking around. Don't. Don't say it one more time. You'll summon him. Tony said half-jokingly. What? Naruto? Pepper retorted. He's not going to appear out of nowhere. She added before instantly regretting it. Naruto suddenly appeared in the living room. Told you. He's like Beetlejuice. Say his name three times and he shows up. Tony exclaimed while Pepper has a sheepish expression. Tony we need to talk. Naruto said seriously. Ugh. Can't this wait? I just microwaved some popcorn. Tony whined. Stain got your scraps. Naruto plainly replied. Scraps? What scraps? Tony asked. Pepper is listening to the conversation intently. The ten rings collected the Mark I scraps and Stain got his hand on it. Naruto answered. What? Didn't I blow that up? Tony exclaimed. Yeah. As far as I can tell, you left nothing but scraps. The only thing they salvaged is the twisted armor. Naruto explained. The problem comes when Stain somehow got footage of the attack on Gulmira. He got some SI scientists and engineers reverse engineering the armor. Tony cursed under his breath. Using RDX to blow up his armor was looking like a bad decision. It looked like he should probably have used a high-temp explosive to melt down the armor. You got the names of the employees helping Stain? Tony asked. Some but not all. I can get the full list tomorrow.
Naruto replied. What are you going to do with them? For now? Nothing. Depending on what happens, I might fire them. Tony said. Jarvis. Search the SI servers for anything that, that might relate to my armor. Start looking into Obi's PC. Immediately, sir. Jarvis quickly confirmed. You should probably keep happy with you at all times. Rody would be even better. He's looking for a valid power source, and you've got the only viable one. He might make a play for it. Naruto advised. Tony unconsciously placed his hand on his chest. The one currently inside his chest was a second version of the arc reactor. It has double the output of the first arc reactor. There was just no telling what Stain could do if he got his hand on the miniature arc reactor. You guys still got the knife I gave you guys? Tony and Pepper look at each other before Pepper answered. We still got it, but we can't exactly bring it with us. A knife isn't exactly the most discreet thing ever. Pepper replied. Naruto adopted a more contemplative look. Give me your arm. Naruto requested but Tony and Pepper were a little apprehensive. Come on, it's not going to hurt. Tony and Pepper reluctantly extended their left and right arm respectively. Naruto grabbed onto their wrist until some kind of writing appeared above the pulse point. The writing started to fade until it completely disappeared. Just rub your wrist if you're in trouble. I should show up and get you out of there. Tony and Pepper stared at the spot where the writing showed up. There's also a small load of Yang Chakra in there which should help with small wounds and bruises. How about Morgan? Pepper asked. I already gave her the bracelet. That's more than enough to take out a standard assault squad. Naruto replied absent-mindedly before walking towards the couch and dropping beside Tony. Man, this day just keeps coming. He said before releasing a sigh. Never thought I'll ever see you tired. Tony commented. What has got you so wound up? Not enough time with the ladies? He teased while wagging his eyebrows. Yeah. There's also the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. finally found the guy your old man kept on looking for. Naruto replied. Tony took a few seconds to understand who Naruto was talking about. Though he got assaulted by mixed emotions when he figured out who Naruto was talking about. They found the captain? Yup. Brought him back to New York a few hours ago. Tony stayed silent after he got his confirmation. Pepper could clearly see the internal battle that Tony was fighting. Okay. What are you guys talking about? Pepper interjected. Remember Coulson? Pepper nodded at Naruto's question. He found Captain America. Like the Captain America. Yup. In a plane 10M below the ice somewhere near Greenland. Huh. When and where are they going to bury him? Pepper asked. There will be no burial. Well at least for some time. Naruto retorted. The guy is still alive. The super soldier serum kept him alive. He just needs some thawing out and he's good to go. Tony and Pepper were obviously surprised. It had been almost 70 years from when the plane crashed. How the hell was he still alive? Morgan had already fallen asleep sometime during the conversation. All the adult talk probably bored the hell out of her. Naruto stood up and did some small stretches. All right. I need to check up on the girls. Call me if you need anything. Naruto announced before disappearing. Tony and Pepper took a few moments before they recovered from Naruto's news. Next time we have some downtime. Never say his name. Got it? Tony said. No problem. Already learned my lesson. Pepper replied. Chapter 59, 
Ironmonger. Stark Industries Factory, Los Angeles. June 30th, 2009, 2000 H Local. Sir, we're down to 15% power. Jarvis reminded. I know. I know. Tony replied, before using the last of his flares to get, get out of Stain's grip. WTF, man. You're just going to sit up there. He shouted through the comms. Yup. Clean up your own mess. I told you to toss him out of the company and be done with it. Naruto retorted. Tony just grumbled back. Naruto was currently on top of a Roxon building two blocks away, watching the fight between the armored suit and the giant man. Having a good day. Considering that my men and I just had to outrun that behemoth, I'll just say that it has been a typical workday. Carlson answered. Naruto picked him up right after he gave his men orders. I could have used a heads up that there was a Goliath in there. I thought you knew. How could Shield not know? You guys were tailing the dude for at least a month, and you had no idea what he was doing. What a spy agency. Naruto commented. Coulson didn't even try to counter Naruto's argument. Shield was widely regarded as the best spy and paramilitary force to ever grace the surface of the earth. They pride themselves in always being ready to deal with a wide variety of circumstances. To achieve this level of preparedness, they gather as much information on everyone as possible. That was why he was so irked when they were caught unaware by the mass of steel. He would make sure that somebody will get fired by that massive oversight. Though to be fair, I didn't expect Stain to build something so huge. His scientists must have encountered problems with making a suit, so they just made him a mech instead. Naruto added while staring at the monstrosity that Stain was wearing, or more like piloting. The Goliath was around 25 feet high and maybe weighing 5 tons. Naruto used his shinigan to study Stain's armor, and he was not really surprised by what he saw. Two miniguns for each arm, anti-tank guns, and a couple of missiles. Just basing on what he can see, the armor was powerful AF. It was basically a walking tank. He wouldn't say it straight to Tony's face, but he low-key thought that Stain's armor was fantastic. Fantastic. Tony's six feet two inches, red and gold armor practically looked like a midget compared to Stain's. Tony couldn't take a solid hit from Stain since he was unsure if his armor could take the punishment. The one advantage he had over the Goliath was that he was faster and more agile. The bulkiness of the monstrosity prevented it from making any motion without doing some form of wind-up. Tony couldn't do anything but do hit and run attacks to the joints and exposed parts of Stain's armor, but it looked like he couldn't keep it up for long since his arc reactor was running out of juice. He's slowing down. I need to call in some backup. Fury will blow a gasket if he finds out that the golden boy died. Carlson said while pulling out his phone. Don't you mean furious? Naruto replied with a chuckle to which Carlson was thoroughly unimpressed. Call for backup but don't let them help him for now. Care to tell me the reason why? Carlson asked while staring at Naruto incredulously. Cause you still need some Avengers candidate, and this is Tony's hero moment. The first Avenger and the ex-merchant of death in the same team. Highly volatile, but it could work. Naruto explained. He could die. Carlson retorted. He won't, but Tony doesn't need to know that. Naruto argued. Carlson released a sigh and relayed Naruto's request to the backup team. The duo could see a team working their way towards the SI factory, while making sure to stay away from the fighting knights. It looks like the backup wouldn't have any use for now since Tony decided to do something new, boosting straight up towards the stratosphere. Stain didn't disappoint, though since panels around the Goliath's leg opened up, and this opened revealing powerful rockets that propelled the massive construct upward. The rockets left behind a crater, showing e evidence of just how powerful they were. 
damn, look at them go. Naruto stated, genuinely impressed with what was happening. Wait here a second. I need to pick up Pepper. I got a feeling that they're going to kick it up a notch if Tony's plan fails. He explained before disappearing. Coulson ignored Naruto's sudden disappearance, since he had already seen it so many times before. He had to agree with Naruto's statement. Desperation can make a man do a whole lot of stupid, and Stain would most likely be desperate after whatever Tony is planning. After a few seconds, Naruto reappeared on the roof with a disoriented pepper. Ugh. I have to agree with Tony. I'm not too fond of your teleportation thingy. Pepper said while trying to hold back her lunch. It only took a few moments before the redhead's temper flared up. What are you doing here with Phil just watching Tony fight that thing? Coulson subtly moved back to get away from the redhead's target. He had a lot of experience of dealing with angry redheads, since he had a close working relationship with NAT. But it looked like Naruto was not afraid of Pepper, or he just didn't have any sense of self-preservation. First of all, it's Horatian and not teleportation thingy. Naruto retorted half-jokingly before getting a lot more serious. And as for us not doing anything, it's because of the fact that it is not our fight. He needs to do it himself. It's better for him to work it out on his own. Especially in a safe, controlled environment like this. Safe and controlled environment. You call this safe and controlled? Pepper retorted while pointing to the rising Tony and Stain. Oh yeah, definitely. Shield is here to control the environment, while I'm here to make sure that he won't die. See, safe and controlled environment. Naruto answered calmly, but Pepper was still pissed off and unconvinced. Just watch. He's not going to die today. He added. Where's Morgan, by the way? Pepper took a series of deep breaths until she calmed down enough. She's with Happy in the safe house. Pepper replied. What happened anyway? I haven't checked on Tony for a week, and the next thing I know, Tony got his chest piece removed and was on the verge of dying. Good thing he had a Horatian tattoo on him. Naruto asked. Coulson listened in on the conversation trying to get something that he could report. Jarvis reported a separate archive that he couldn't access in Obi computer. Tony couldn't precisely walk towards Stain's office without getting mobbed on the way there. Pepper started. I got definitive proof of everything that Obi has done. Backdoor selling, skewed contracts, and the Ten Rings renegotiating their deal with him. She said with a sneer. I saw Phil on my way out and brought him to deal with Obi's monstrosity before it got started. We just got there too late. And none of you tried to call me? Naruto replied sarcastically before they heard something huge dropping near the SI factory. Don't worry. That's just Stain. I thought that was going to take him out. Tony was on the rooftop, catching his breath. He was down to 6% power. Just enough to keep the suit from turning into a statue. He walked over towards where Obi dropped. As expected, the ceiling couldn't take the force of the behemoth dropping from 35,000 feet. Stain just punched three floors into the basement. He peeked through the hole and saw something alarming. Stain's massive suit was nowhere to be found, and the breaking sound under him was not a good sign. A massive metal hand broke through under him and wrapped around his body, effectively trapping him. Tony's suit was groaning due to the force of the, force of the grip. Stain worked his way up the rooftop. The Goliath had dents, scratches, and missing parts. Most notably, the missing helmet. Tony could see Obi's bruised and bleeding face. That wasn't very nice, Tony. Obi wheezed out, referring to letting him drop from high up. He only managed to survive by forcibly opening up the air brakes, slowing him just enough not to die. Well, leaving me to die on my own wasn't nice either. 
Tony retorted with his usual attitude, while thinking of how to get out of the situation. He looked around and saw the only viable plan given the circumstances. He disabled the external speakers. Jarvis, overload the arc reactor and push the discharge to the rooftop. He ordered. Jarvis could take over any system connected to the central server ever since he had been uploaded into the Stark Industries system. Are you sure, sir? It might kill you, sir. It would also cause massive damage to the factory and take it out of operation for at least three months. Jarvis asked for confirmation. Just do it. I'll die now if I don't do anything. Tony retorted. He could already hear the external plating bend. All right, sir. Fifteen seconds from discharge. Jarvis informed Tony while placing a countdown timer at the heads-up display. Tony reoriented his hand so that the repulsors on his palm are aimed towards Obi's face or somewhere close to it. He fired the repulsors, which missed Obi's head, but just enough to startle him and get out of his grip. Tony created some distance and fired his unibeam straight towards Obi's face. This caused Obi to stumble backward, right into the path of the arc reactor. Five, four, three, two, one. Tony counted down. When the countdown reached zero, a beam of blue light fired up into the sky, enveloping Stain in a wave of energy. From a distance, Naruto could see everything that was happening to Stain. Weirdly enough, his armor was the first one to go. His armor slowly melted before disintegrating. The same thing happened with Stain himself, the flesh started melting, but it quickly charred before disintegrating. Well, he's dead. Naruto informed Pepper and Coulson nonchalantly. We should go back down. Pepper felt so much lighter. She knew it was terrible to be thankful that Obi was finally dead, but it was either him or Tony, and she would always choose Tony to live. Naruto grabbed hold of Pepper and Coulson before using Horation. They reappeared just in front of Tony, who was lying flat on his back with his face plate open. Pepper immediately ran towards Tony and knelt beside him, checking for any injuries visible on his face. She started stroking his cheek, but he still didn't open his eyes. She raised Tony's head and laid him on her lap. How much power you got left? Naruto asked. 0.5%. I already disconnected my suit, so I'll just be lying here until it recharges back to 5%. Tony replied without looking at anyone. He was too tired to do anything else. All right. How long is that anyway? Naruto asked again. Maybe twenty minutes, at least. Tony replied. Damn. Okay. Coulson and I are going to give you two some privacy while we clean up some of this. Naruto stated before walking towards the rooftop access with Coulson behind him. How are you going to sweep this all under the rug? With a mess this huge, we don't sweep this under the rug. We just redirect the public's attention to something else, while making a bigger mess to cover up this one. Coulson answered, already thinking about which plan would work the best for the current situation. It looked like they would need to use their celebrity contacts to create some sort of scandal for them to get by. I'll call for a cleanup crew. We need to clear some debris and tag some tech to make sure no one gets a hold of it. You do that. I'm on guard duty. Naruto said before disappearing, leaving Coulson on the staircase alone. Stark Industries Office, Los Angeles. July 1st. 2009, 1000H local. Naruto was currently walking towards the side room, wearing his bodyguard disguise. That was where Tony, Pepper, and Morgan were staying while waiting for the start of the press conference. He had no idea what plan Coulson decided to use, but he was sure that it would go off the rails. He heard talking as he got close to the door. Just follow the script I gave you, and we'll take care of the rest.
Naruto heard Carlson say before the door suddenly opened. Mr. Umber. Carlson greeted Naruto using his pseudonym before walking away. Can't even stay around and chat a bit, huh? Naruto mused to himself before walking inside the room and closing the door. What's up? He greeted the family. Tony was reading some cue cards that were probably given to him by Carlson while Pepper was fixing up Tony's suit. Morgan quickly jumped off the couch and ran towards Naruto. He quickly picked her up and carried her. You're getting big, princess. He said to Morgan. Can you believe it? They're calling me Iron Man. The suit is not even made of iron. It's a titanium gold alloy composite with carbon lamination. Tony complained before quickly changing his mind. You know what? I kind of like it. It's catchy. You should have heard what they're calling Stain. Iron Munger or Iron Goliath. Naruto countered. Why not Iron Giant? Pepper interjected. Cause there's already a movie about Iron Giant, and he's a good guy. Naruto answered. Pepper looked at her phone on the table when it lit up. Everything's ready. We should go. Pepper told Tony. All right. Just let me take this. Tony replied. He took a bottle of soda before leaving. Naruto followed the couple towards the main hall. He was going to stay some ways back while still carrying Morgan, just to prevent her from running around and getting mobbed. Mobbed. Ten minutes later. Do it. Do it. Come on, do it. Naruto whispered repeatedly. Don't do it. Don't do it. Carlson countered repeatedly. The pair were standing at the back of the room, looking over the press conference. One might ask what they were talking about, and there was one simple answer, Tony hesitating on reading the cue cards that Carlson gave him. I am Iron Man. Tony stated, causing all the reporters to go wild. Naruto laughed hard, since he was right that something like this would happen. Why can't anything be easy? Carlson mused. Stark Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles. July 1st, 2009, 2300 H Local. Tony was with Pepper on the bed, who was already asleep. They had a really long day, and he had no one to blame it on but himself. The press were like piranhas, doing anything for a nibble of a story. He was about to fall asleep when Jarvis spoke up. Sir, there's someone in the living room. Jarvis informed Tony. Tony quickly got up and reached for a 13-round taser gun. He thought about calling Naruto, but he could just call him if he can't handle it. Does he look hostile? Tony asked while loading up the taser gun. It doesn't look like it, sir. Jarvis replied. Tony walked out of the room and slowly worked his way towards the living room. When he reached the living room, he saw a silhouette of a man, facing the panoramic windows. He hid the gun behind him and walked towards the man, but made sure to keep his distance. I am Iron Man. The man started. You think you're the only superhero? Mr. Stark, you just became part of a bigger universe, but you just don't know it yet. He added. As if dealing with gamma radiation saturated scientists, enhanced individuals, and aliens are not enough. Now I have to deal with a spoiled billionaire, who doesn't work well with others and likes to keep all his toys to himself. Who the hell are you? Tony asked a little threateningly. The man walked into the light with a confident stride, revealing a bald African-American man with an eye patch on his left eye and wearing an all-black tactical suit covered by a black trench coat. Nick Fury Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Fury introduced himself with a subtle smirk. I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers Initiative. Set an appointment. I'll be available in three months. Tony retorted sarcastically. 
The Avengers Initiative is something I thought up. Gathering the best the world has to offer, and set them up to deal with things the world is not prepared to deal with. Fury ignored Tony's quip. The world's first and last line of defense. Who else is on this team of yours? No one yet, but I've got some prospects. Fury replied. I'm here because a common acquaintance of ours recommended you. Although I still would have scouted you without the recommendation. It's Naruto, isn't it? Tony asked, 99% sure of the answer. Him and Coulson. Fury answered while walking towards the door. There's a file packet on the dining room table. Take a look at it. I'll contact you sometime in the future. He said before walking out of the mansion. Tony walked towards the dining room and saw a thin file folder on the table. He picked it up and scanned through it. There was just one thing he realized as he was reading through it. What the hell did I get myself into? Chapter 60, Looking in the Files Stark Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles July 2, 2009 0900H Local So Fury finally showed himself, huh? Naruto said when he saw the folder, Tony was reading. Tony turned around and went towards the dining room entrance. Damn, did you sleep? Tony had dark circles under his eyes. To answer your question, a creepy pirate did indeed come, and I couldn't sleep after I started reading this. Tony replied as his usual sarcastic self. I had Jarvis search for everything he could find about what's in here. Naruto asked, genuinely curious about what Jarvis could have found considering S.H.I.E.L.D.'s strict information control. Something and nothing at the same time. Tony picked up his phone on the table and scrolled through it. I got a lot of news articles, journals, papers, social media, conspiracy theories, yada yada. But the thing is, I got nothing substantial on anyone in this except for the banner guy. What makes him so different? I already met him at some conventions. Brilliant guy, a little weird. Maybe that's just what happens if you collect seven doctorates. Tony answered absent-mindedly before he realized he was moving away from the topic. Anyway, I got most of his papers with electromagnetic waves, particularly high-energy radiation. I have to say the guy really is a genius. He added. I found a lot of clips of him wrecking the military. I guess that's what they wanted the sonic cannon for. You're missing two guys in here. Naruto removed the cover page of each Avenger candidate and lined them up on the table. Interestingly enough, Nat's and Clint's photos used generic silhouettes and were heavily redacted. Banner's cover page also had some partial redaction. We're not going to discuss the two silhouettes since their files are redacted for a reason. All I can say is that they are agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The cream of the crop. He explained. Banner's files are partially redacted because of his work with the military. Your files are not redacted for obvious reasons. He moved the cover photos to the side and retrieved two sheets of paper from behind him. This is my file. I have no idea why it's not there. Maybe they thought you know me enough, but anyway, here it is if you would like to read it. Partially redacted, of course. Now, this is the CAPS file. I guess Fury still wants him to be kept secret since they still haven't woken him up. Tony took both sheets of paper and looked over it, starting with Cap's file. There were still some redacted areas on it, but probably less, less than before. The redacted areas were mainly focused on Project Rebirth. What surprised him, though, was the number of missions listed. He's no military man but he was sure that doing over 100 special ops missions in the span of two years was impressive enough, but add the fact that there were no failures. The Boy Scout was just showing off. He moved his focus to the other sheet of paper, and he noticed that there were more redacted areas compared to the captain's, but not enough to make it annoying like the agent's profiles. 
He skimmed over it and noted that he already knew most of what's inside. The only detail added that piqued his curiosity was the aliases and works Naruto has done. Nine Tails and the Fox, code names given to the most prolific and effective information broker slash mercenary out there. There were only estimated jobs done since most of it was done in secret, and the number alone was staggering. Approximated 5,000 information gathering jobs and 800 mercenary jobs. What the fuck, man? How the hell did you do 5,800 jobs? Tony exclaimed. Naruto did a single hand sign before a clone of himself appeared beside him. Shadow clones. I got thousands of these guys around the world though not all of them are active. Naruto replied. Only a few hundred of his clones were not hinged as inanimate objects, while merely a few dozen are not disguised. Cheating alien bastard, Tony mumbled before going back to the folder and cross-referencing everything that he could find. Naruto decided to just stay silent and fix some breakfast, since he could sense Pepper preparing herself for the day. He turned on the coffee machine and cooked some eggs and bacon. He finished cooking just in time since Pepper walked down the stairs as he transferred the food to the plates. Wow, Naruto is cooking this morning. Pepper excitedly. She considered Naruto's cooking as one of the best out there. Naruto placed the food and coffee in front of Tony and Pepper before setting one for himself. Eat up. You two got a lot to do today, but Tony will probably stay behind studying those little s folders. Naruto replied. Pepper took a bite and released a small moan. She still had no idea how Naruto could make eggs and bacon taste so good. She looked towards Tony and noticed that his sole focus was on the folder in front of him. How long has he been awake? Pepper asked. Probably the whole night. A one-eyed pirate came to visit last night and gave Tony that folder. Naruto answered, intentionally leaving out that the pirate was trying to recruit Tony into his super-secret superhero boy band. What? Nick Fury, the head honcho of S.H.I.E.L.D., came to visit. You should ask him about it, not me. He's your fiancé. Pepper felt that Naruto was hiding something, but she decided to ignore it for now. She stood up and walked behind Tony and tapped his shoulder. Tony was obviously startled but quickly recovered when he saw who it was. Hi, Peps. How long have you been there? Tony asked. Long enough. Pepper replied with a small huff. What are you reading there? That does not look like our typical company report. Oh, this. Some one-eyed black guy gave this to me. Said something about the Avengers initiative. These are the candidates he wanted. Tony answered truthfully, not even bothering to lie. By the way, we're going to hire a bodyguard just for you. Some things out there are just crazy. Pepper reached for the folder in Tony's hand and started to skim through it. To say she was shocked was an understatement. Super spies are somewhat believable. World War II, super soldiers? She already knew about that thanks to Naruto. Naruto. Advance exosuit slash armor? Her fiancé was the one who made it. What really got to her was a scientist that could transform into a green rage monster, and the guy inside their house right now. One of the best information brokers slash mercenaries around. She knew Naruto was some kind of muscle for hire, but how good was the guy to earn him a do not engage status? They wanted Tony to join this? Pepper asked Naruto. Yup. The Avengers, the first and last defense of humanity against any enemy that they are not prepared to face. Naruto replied. Fury wants to build a team that can fight guys like me. He said, causing incredulous looks to form on Tony's and Pepper's face. Well, not guys like me, that's just a massacre waiting to happen, but aliens and extra-dimensional entities. Tony's eyes widened and latched onto one detail. 
Aliens are real? Not like you but like E.T. and Martian kind of thing? Tony inquired. Hey. I'm an alien. Naruto retorted, but Tony just raised his eyebrow. I'm not alien-like, but I can still be an alien. Naruto released a sigh. There are aliens. We don't get too much alien traffic since Earth is a backroad planet, at least that's what Fury has in his files. However, there are still a good number of aliens currently with us. If we are a backwater planet, is there really a threat from out there? You would be surprised. As far as records go, the most recent incident that almost wiped out humanity happened in 1995. According to Fury's hidden files, Cree accusers had already launched a wave of orbital bombardment kinetic thermobaric bombs. I have no idea what the hell an accusers is, but Cree is an alien race that has blue skin. Naruto recounted, ignoring the Stark's aghast expression. Good thing Fury met a human alien chick that took care of the problem. Human alien? Don't you mean half alien? Pepper interjected. Not li like human alien. She's a human that was taken by aliens and brainwashed. Don't worry, she's fine now. Naruto replied. Pepper stared at Naruto before snapping out of her stupor. I miss the time when the only problem I had was fixing up the company reports. Pepper stated. I can't believe that ignorance really is bliss. Tony was just staring out into nothingness, his mind running a thousand miles a second. Ever since he started inventing, he was always a problem solver. Engine not putting out enough power? Just slap a turbo on it. Missile targeting system acting up? Invent a hybrid targeting system to fix it. The problem he was trying to solve now was the proverbial axe hovering over their neck, aliens with a fleet designed to decimate the population on the planet. He really doesn't like the feeling of helplessness. Tony, Tony. You okay there? Naruto called out, causing Tony to shake his head. You have to tell me that you have got vital information on those aliens. Tony said seriously, expecting that Naruto would turn into his usual how the fuck did he know about that self. Sorry to disappoint you, man, but I don't have much info on anything out there, only what public and private organizations have like Fury's private files. Naruto answered a little sheepishly. And from what I can tell, the aliens on our planet are outcasts and refugees. The largest alien community has a hundred individuals of shapeshifters called Skrulls. They're left over from the main refugee group that left in 1995, so they don't have many files and alien tech with them. Tony unconsciously released a groan. How about the Kree? What does Fury have on them? Tony asked with a hint of desperation. The Kree Empire is a militaristic race that has an AI as its leader. They're the ones that pushed the Skrulls to the brink of extinction. Naruto said, trying to recount what Fury has in his files. Files. Based on the world's average technological level, we are maybe 50 years behind them. Their blood can also be used by humans to accelerate healing and possibly revive the dead. Who the hell tested that? Pepper interrupted. An independent research group Fury established. They acquired a half-dead body of a Cree and started testing shit with it. Tony stood up and retrieved the Avengers folder from Pepper's hands before walking out of the room, presumably towards his workshop. Naruto and Pepper couldn't do anything but stare at Tony's retreating back. So is he going to eat that or what? Naruto asked, pointing to the untouched food. New York City, New York. July 12th. 2009, 1000 H local. Naruto and Peggy were currently in an office space he rented overlooking the Shield safe house. In front of them was a collection of screens showing the interior of the safe house. The largest screen was showing a small room, an imitation hospital room from the 1940s. At its side is a screen showing the large room where the mock hospital room was placed. 
Fury basically ignored Naruto's advice. It was only a day ago when Fury gave Coulson the all-clear to wean Captain Rogers from the anesthesia. According to the medical requisition forms, they were using ten times the recommended amount just to keep the captain knocked out. This only reinforced the physiological changes the super soldier serum had on the captain. Shield and what he assumed were Hydra agents, as well as some agents from private companies, have all been trying to get biological samples from the first successful super soldier to create their own version. The key word was trying. Naruto had been replacing the blood and hair samples with ones from a golden retriever, the perfect animal substitute for the captain if there ever was one. Not that he was going to say it any time soon. How can he be so stupid? I taught him better than that. Peggy complained with a groan. To be fair, you taught him to think like a spy. His default is to keep secrets and lie. Nobody can just go against their nature at the drop of a hat. Naruto replied. This caused Peggy to glare at Naruto. Don't start with me today. I'm not in the mood. Peggy countered before looking back at Steve's sleeping form. Naruto looked at the other feeds, focusing on one monitor in particular. He could see Coulson briefing a red-haired agent named Grace Van Pelt. He was looking into everything else in the base. As far as he could tell, the only other thing noteworthy in the base was a garage filled with two security team squads. He was still focusing on monitoring the safe house when somebody knocked on the door. Peggy quickly drew her gun and aimed it at the door, thinking that some undesirables figured out their position. However, she noticed that Naruto remained calm and just continued checking the feeds. Come in. Naruto shouted, which partially surprised Peggy. The door slowly opened, revealing Jessica carrying a coffee tray and a paper bag from the coffee shop around the corner. Hey, I brought coffee. Jessica greeted before closing the door. She sauntered towards Naruto and gave him a quick peck before dropping the food and coffee on the table. So, what are we doing here? Checking out how S.H.I.E.L.D. is going to fuck up waking up Captain America. Naruto answered. What time is your class? My 3 p.m. class canceled, so I'm free for the whole day. Jessica walked towards the screen where the captain was still sleeping. Wow, he looks damn hot for a guy sleeping for over 60 years. Naruto immediately turned his head towards Jessica with mock indignation. Hey. I'm hot. Naruto retorted, causing Jessica to chuckle. I'm, I'm not saying you're not hot. I'm saying that I can understand one of the reasons why Aunt Peggy here can't get over the guy. Jessica sent an exaggerated wink towards Peggy, causing her to blush. So anyone care to tell me what they're going to do? Naruto nodded and turned around towards the monitors. He pointed towards the screen where Agent Van Pelt was talking with Coulson. See that redhead there? Jessica nodded. She's going to dress as a 1940s nurse when Captain Rogers wakes up. They are going to try to convince him that he has just been retrieved from the ice a week or so after the crash. How is that going to work? They can't just lock him up in that room forever. Jessica commented perfectly encapsulating one of the problems in Fury's plan. You're going to graduate college with honors. No doubt about it. Naruto said seriously. Jessica smiled when she heard Naruto's comment. She walked in front of Naruto and sat on his lap before looping her arms around Naruto's neck and kissed him. Peggy ignored the couple and just focused on the feed. A few minutes later, she noticed that Steve Rogers was finally waking up, evident by the shake of his head. She couldn't help but flash a smile when she finally saw Steve's clear blue eyes. Naruto and Jessica noticed Peggy's emotional moment and quieted down, giving her a moment to enjoy the moment. Shield Safe House, New York July 12, 2009, 1100H Local Steve Rogers, a.k.a. Captain America. 
The first Avenger. The first superhero. Widely regarded as the human representation of freedom. One of the most influential factors that pushed the World War II effort in favor of the Allies, Allies, by leading the Howling Commandos against the Johann Schmidt, or Red Skull, and HYDRA. Steve Grant Rogers was born on July 4, 1918, to Sarah and Joseph Rogers. His father was killed in action during World War I. He had always been a small and sickly kid, causing him to form only one significant friendship in the form of one James Buchanan Barnes. His mother died from tuberculosis during his last year of high school. When Steve and Bucky heard that the U.S. finally joined World War II, they immediately tried to enlist, but Steve was always denied due to the many health problems. Bucky, on the other hand, was immediately accepted and sent to basic. Steve Rogers never gave up, though. He tried to enlist at different recruitment centers around New York City. His fate changed during the 1943 Stark Expo. Steve was pulled by Bucky into a double date, but he slipped away to try and enlist once again. Coincidentally, Dr. Abraham Erksine, a defector from Germany, took notice of Steve's morals and fast-tracked Steve's record after a short interview. Steve was sent to Camp Lehigh for assessment and training. He was chosen by Dr. Erksine for Project Rebirth, a top-secret super-soldier program by the U.S. military and the Strategic Scientific Reserve, or SSR, the predecessor of S.H.I.E.L.D. Project Rebirth was a success causing Steve Rogers to pack muscle and gain almost a foot of height. However, Dr. Erksine was killed by an undercover agent, effectively killing Project Rebirth. Steve Rogers, or now known as Captain America, was used as a mascot and propaganda machine, boosting U.S. military recruitment. His fate changed yet again when he went on an undercover mission to rescue Allied soldiers, particularly the 107th Infantry Regiment, which Bucky was a part of, from a Nazi H HYDRA concentration camp. This mission alone had proven his worth as a soldier and leader. Captain America led multiple raids against multiple Hydra bases with his specialized unit, the Howling Commandos. Along the way, Howard Stark gifted Captain Rogers with a circular shield made from vibranium, one of the strongest metals known to man. Every win he accomplished over Hydra tilted the war in favor of the Allies, but everything must come to an end. The first blow came with the death of Bucky Barnes during the mission to apprehend Dr. Arnim Zola. The next blow, however, came with the defeat of the Red Skull. As a last-ditch effort to deal considerable damage to the U.S., the Red Skull harnessed the Tesseract's energy to create bombs that would decimate the U.S. cities. The Red Skull was able to take off with one of the bombers forcing Captain Rogers to crash the plane in the Arctic Circle. Everyone thought that the captain perished that day, but multiple search and retrieval missions were done to find the captain's body. Howard Stark successfully found the Tesseract, but not the captain. Captain America inspired the U.S. to build S.H.I.E.L.D. Steve Rogers never expected that he would be able to wake up alive. He fully expected to wake up in the afterlife, heaven or hell, wherever he was destined to go. He pushed himself up on the bed and observed his surroundings. There was something disconcerting with everything he was sensing. He focused his attention on the live baseball game on the radio. It didn't take long before a nurse-slash-secretary check up on him. Morning. The nurse greeted smoothly before checking her watch. Or should I say afternoon? Where am I? Steve asked. You're in a recovery room in New York. The nurse answered. Steve listened in on the surroundings and confirmed that the statement was not quite right. One of the side effects of the super soldier serum was the acquisition of an eidetic memory. Where am I, really? Steve asked again slowly. I don't understand. The nurse replied, getting a little nervous. The game, it's from May 1941. I know because I was there. Steve stated with absolute certainty. Van Pelt knew that the plan had failed, so she immediately pushed the panic button. 
He stood up from the bed and walked towards Van Pelt. So I'm going to ask again, where am I? Captain Rogers. The nurse said, trying to calm down the situation. Who are you? Steve shouted, but four armed men in black combat suits entered the room. New York City, New York. July 12th, 2009, 1130H local. Well, that was a dud. As expected. Naruto said while looking out the window. He was looking at Captain Rogers running barefoot down the street towards Times Square. He then turned towards Peggy. What do you want to do now? Peggy took a deep breath to calm down her mind. All she wanted to do was run out the door to meet Steve face to face again, but she knew it was not exactly viable right now. She needed to remain hidden for as long as possible to keep an advantage over HYDRA. We're going to wait for Fury to bring him to the old gym before meeting him. Peggy stated. For now, we should keep watch of the situation.